Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for coming in this atrocious weather to today's History of Gardens and Landscapes seminar. And um, just before I introduce Emil, I'm going to hand over to our, our chair of the conveners, um, Christine Lalumia, who's online. She's joining us on Zoom from sunny North Suffolk, I think, just to say a few sort of housekeeping announcements. Christine? Thanks, Shahrazad. Um, welcome all. Um, hello, you know, hello on a wild, wild weather night certainly is where I am. And well done to any of you who made it into Senate House. Brilliant. Um, just some very, very quick housekeeping. First is to say, and I've mentioned this before, um, but it's important to, to just keep reminding people we're doing a short but essential confidential survey about the seminar. And this will be sent to everyone that's currently on our mailing list in the next few days. Uh, one reason for doing the survey is to ask seminar attendees for their opinions on topics relating to the format of the seminars, the content, the technology, et cetera. Um, and as importantly, we are going to ask anyone who wishes to remain on the mailing list to indicate this and give their permission by filling in the correct email, their correct email. And this goes right into one of the, you know, formatted questions in the uh, survey. So very easy. The survey will take literally five minutes or less. And we really do hope that we get a healthy number of responses because it will help us a lot to know what people are thinking, especially since we've flipped into doing a lot of Zoom and we don't see people as often. The second announcement has to do with the um, uh, Conversations Across Garden History publication that we put out at the end of last year. Um, we'd like to tell you that the, a digital version is coming and it will be available shortly through Amazon, as is the paperback version, um, at a lower price of 14 pounds. And we hope that many of you who may have missed the paperback version last year will, will check out this ebook, as it were. Um, we'll let you know in a future mailing when it is available, but it is soon. And finally, the Birkbeck Garden History Group is holding a study day for 2024. And um, they've asked us to, to mention this. It sounds fascinating. Water in Modern Designed Landscapes on Saturday, the 9th of March. And it's organized by Birkbeck Garden History Group, as I said, who are great supporters of this seminar. And it's on the use of water in 20th and 21st century gardens, industrial, uh, public landscapes, canals, river surrounds, et cetera. Chaired by Dominic Cole, and the speakers include Katie Campbell, Hal Mogridge, Alan Powers, and Jason Debney. So in London, uh, five minutes walk from the Angel, all are welcome. And for further information, you can go to Birkbeck Garden History Bookings at gmail.com. So that's it from me. End of housekeeping. Thank you all for joining this evening. And now to Shahrazad to... Um, who has all the pleasure of welcoming our speaker, Emil. Thank you, Christine. Um, just further to what she was saying about the book, the seminar publication, there's three copies there. Um, just to plug, they're on sale for £20 if anyone would like to buy one or, or have a leaf through one before buying one on Amazon. Um, but the real reason we're here is because Emile de Bran from National Trust has just published a beautiful, beautiful book called Borrowed Landscapes, um, China and Japan in the Historical Houses and Gardens in Britain and Ireland, if I got the second part yes. of the title correctly. So um, Emile de Brown is, I'm sure you know, is a national curator at the National Trust. He studied Japanese and Japanese art history at Leiden University for his undergraduate um, <clears throat> museology at the University of Essex, and then went to Sotheby's where he joined the Japanese and... Chinese, Chinese department. Um, and I think probably most of you know, he's done the most beautiful book on Chinese wallpaper in England, a National Trust publication. And if you don't have it, it's really worth having. Um, and as I said, I think he'll put his, a copy of his book up on, on a slide for at the very last slide, I think it is, you can see. So um, over to you, Emil. Great, thank you. thank you very much indeed. And um, do let us know if you can't, 
here properly, uh, equally online. Um, but I'll I'll start. And yes, as Shahrazad was saying, I'm a, a curator working for the National Trust um, in the area of decorative art and also East Asian art. Um, and I'm interested in the impact of China and Japan on historic houses and uh, gardens in the British Isles um, and to understand better how that developed and how East Asian material culture became an integral part of British material culture. Um, and that's a kind of history that goes back around four, 400 years um, to the early 17th century and garden design has reflected that development. So I'll focus on garden design of course, this evening. Um, and I think that development and that engagement with East Asia can be described as a form of Orientalism, um, as Edward Said famously um, wrote about that, that concept. Um, as Said said, it's, uh, it's a kind of representation of the East for the West and the image images created of the East often reflected um, various Western preoccupations. So it's a fascinating kind of two-sided complex phenomenon. And I think we can see that in the way, not just as Said wrote about, uh, mainly about the Middle East, I think it also applies to the Western engagement with East Asia. And um, Orientalism in Garden, in Western gardens is often linked to developments in interiors as well, although sometimes in surprising ways. For instance, there was a boom in Chinese style garden pavilions in the mid 18th century, um, surprising in, in some ways. And there was a boom in Japanese gardens being built in Britain in around 1900, things like that. So links, but also um, differences between the garden and the interior. Um, another interesting phenomenon is that in the 17th century, there was a lot of admiration for East Asia in Europe, but equally there was hardly any sense of authenticity at the time. The idea of authentic East Asian culture was not very well developed in Europe. So that's a kind of um, paradox. Post-1800, Western attitudes to Asia became much more critical in the sort of imperialist age, but equally people became more interested in what was authentically Chinese and authentically Japanese. So again, it's a kind of paradox. Um, so those are some of the things I'll be touching on in this talk. Um, and um, it, it kind of revolves around this, this idea of, of Orientalism as as a cultural construct, uh, constructing an image of another culture uh, and how that affects your own culture. Let's see, trying to move the slide. Uh, okay. Doesn't seem to work with the button, so we might have what's, to find what's not another, working? just the forward. Oh, maybe it's because it's gone to sleep or something. Um, and I was just trying to okay. do that, but does it's it work now? No. <laughs> it's always throwing something at us. No. If I stop. Can I try that thing? Yeah. Does that thing work or not? I have a go. Let's see if we can move that. Do anything. I'm going to come out of screen share okay. and then go back in yeah. um, to screen share. Which I don't Maybe think. I've already been talking too long and it's <laughs> it's got fed up and uh, we need to start again. I wonder if it's just best to maybe... If we can move one for... Ah, there we are. It's moving now. Are you happy with this view? Yep. Okay, and are you then, sure? Um, does it work? How does it go, go forward? Like this. Um, I was scrolling. Thing? Oh, you were scrolling. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I've lost the mouse now. I don't know. 
I was just right. Okay. Are you fine with like that? Um, just so. Oh, up. Okay. Mm. Right. Okay. Right. I keep losing the mouse on this. Uh, is the connection gone, oh. Jesse? Back? Yes, that's good. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Emil. Is it possible to turn the lights down? So um, the so from about 1600 we start to see substantial importation of East Asian luxury objects uh, into Europe, such as, for instance, this um, Chinese porcelain so-called crack wear uh, plate. And and here in the word crack we already find an element of of Orientalism because this was the the Dutch or English version of the Portuguese word uh, caraca, uh, name the type of ship that brought these wares to uh, Europe. So already in this kind of naming, we see that, you know, the name that something is being given is more to do with European transport than with the uh, origin of of the material and the object. So it's kind of linguistic uh, Orientalism, but equally Europeans were fascinated by the quality of porcelain, which of course couldn't be produced to the uh, in, in Europe at that time and the intensity of the color. And um, just try and see how I can get to the next one. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Yeah, this seems to work. Good. Uh, and also things like this were being imported into Europe in the early 17th century, lacquer from Japan. Um, and here we see linguistic Orientalism the other way around, because the Japanese called this kind of lacquer namban, which was their word for the southern barbarians, which is how the Europeans were known in Japan, because they arrived in Japan uh, from the south uh, with their ships. And this type of lacquer is already being uh, produced specifically for the European market. The shape of the coffer is European. The decoration was aimed at what Europeans uh, wanted, sort of mother of pearl, quite dense decoration. So um, you can already see the, the, the mechanisms of Orientalism and perhaps self-Orientalism, the Japanese producing goods that they knew were attractive to the West. In the mid um, 17th century, you see this kind of porcelain being imported to the West from China, um, known as transitional porcelain from the period, transitioned from the Ming to the Qing dynasties with beautifully painted landscapes. So this is one of the media through which Europeans became more aware of Chinese landscape aesthetics. And equally, this kind of so-called wuzai porcelain using colored enamels. Of course, the colors would have been extremely attractive and um, sophisticated in the eyes of Europeans. Uh, and equally, it helped to introduce kind of Chinese landscape motifs to the European imagination. And um, another type of porcelain here, Tuhua porcelain, uh, which would have been rather luminous in, you know, dark uh, Baroque interiors lit with fires and candles and so on. So this kind of porcelain was very attractive, but also again, an Orientalist mechanism we have here that originally religious imagery, this is the Buddhist figure Guan Yin, is being um, used in Europe for completely different uh, purposes, for more decorative purposes. But equally, the relaxed pose of the figure was probably influencing what's happening in the portrait on the right. This is at Kingston Lacey, um, uh, Sir Ralph Banks, and um, 
he's actually wearing what was known at the time as, as an India gown. So uh, a, a gown worn in the home in a relaxed um, setting, inspired by actually Japanese kimono, which were coming to Europe as well and were copied in Holland and in England um, to create these India gowns. And um, so an influence on fashion as well. The original um, tradition in China and Japan that these goods were coming out of uh, had a very long-standing uh, uh, culture of burdened flower imagery. You can see uh, an example of this um, here. This is a uh, painting by Yan Wengwei, uh, early 11th century. Um, and uh, no, sorry, this is not Yan. This is uh, Lu Qi, second half of the 15th century in the Palace Museum in Beijing, uh, a beautiful example of a burdened flower painting. And it was naturalistic, but at the same time, it was highly symbolic. So it was a very structured type of image in which bird and flower, birds and flowers took on symbolic roles. And you see this return again and again in Chinese culture. Equally, landscapes like this landscape by Yan Wengui, early 11th century, um, were highly symbolic, representing the um, the dynamic balance of the cosmos as expressed in mountains and water and so on. So very much philosophical and religious as well as um, aesthetic. And it was also had a bearing on society because landscape could also um, express the harmony of the imperial realm where everyone was productive, everyone was working together in harmony with nature, as you can see in this uh, painting uh, called Prosperous Sujo, uh, produced in the 1750s under the direction of Xu Yan for the uh, imperial court. In Europe, these objects using these bird and flower language, the landscape tradition, were essentially completely misunderstood and used for completely in completely different settings and uh, given different meanings. And in, in um, Princess Amalia of Solms, the Princess of Orange, um, who were, met, was um, living in the Dutch Republic, was actually one of the first to use um, Chinese and Japanese lacquer um, in her interior. So she was taking Japanese lacquer objects, disassembling them and using them to um, as wall decoration. And to us, this seems rather brutal, rather uh, disrespectful, but, and this is the an example of the, the sort of lack of sense of authenticity in the 17th century. At the same time, lacquer was highly valuable, highly sought after, so it was combined with admiration. Um, as you can also see in this piece of furniture, slightly later, this is late 17th century, but Amalia von Solms was doing this in the mid 17th century. And her taste had an influence on successive generations of her family who married into the German, uh, the, the Prussian princely family and the English royal family as well. Another um, notable influence at the time was uh, a book published by Johann Neuhoff, who had been to China as part of a diplomatic mission. And his book published in 1665 originally uh, was extremely influential because of the images uh, of China, uh, which were very inspiring. This image of the porcelain pagoda of Nanjing is probably the image that started the European fascination with pagodas and, and Europeans seeing them as symbols of China. But again, it's a kind of Orientalist process because of course these images were translated into a European visual idiom and um, embellished and so on. So um, meaning and images change. Um, this is a garden pavilion in at Versailles, uh, created by Louis XIV for his mistress, Madame de Montespan, in 1670. And it was called the um, Rianon de Porcelaine. Um, it doesn't look particularly Chinese to us, but 
it did to contemporary French court, um, simply because the roofs were encrusted with um, blue glazed earthenware and had blue and white um, ceramics attached to the roof, and the interior was blue and white as well. So here you, it's another fascinating kind of Orientalist move, taking one element of East Asian culture, blue and white porcelain, and using that as an emblem to embellish your gun. This Orientalism was also happening on a more intellectual, um, religious level. The Jesuits who were active in China were publishing books about China, which were very complimentary about Chinese society and culture. Uh, and this book, um, Confucius Sinarum Philosophus, published in 1687 by um, François Couplet and his colleagues, um, tried to explain um, Confucianism to the, the, the sort of the Chinese philosophy, Confucianism, to a European audience. But of course, the word Confucian is, is actually a Jesuit construct, uh, a Latinized version of the name of Kung Fu Tzu, the mythical philosopher. So again, here in the, in the words and in the, the name, you see this translation taking place, this Orientalism happening. In interiors, we see um, at this time the late 17th century, we see objects like this Japanese lacquer cabinet at Felbrick Hall in Norfolk uh, with beautiful uh, herons resting on a willow, um, which is a, a, a Japanese motif. But the shape of the cabinet is very much European based on Portuguese and Spanish furniture. So a completely hybrid kind of object, which would have seemed very alien and exotic to late 17th century Europeans, Dutch and English consumers, but was already hybrid, partly European, partly Asian. Europeans also began to produce glazed earthenware inspired by Chinese porcelain, as you can see here at these Delftware objects. And interestingly, they're copying the naturalistic bird and flower imagery, uh, as you can see there, trying as accurately as possible to represent that. And again, this was one of the ways that this imagery became domesticated in Europe. Newhoff's book was used literally here, as you can see here, uh, in to translate into uh, blue and white glazed earthenware made in, in Delft. And again, the blue and white becomes a kind of emblematic color scheme associated with, with China. But also Chinese made blue and white porcelain of the Kangxi dynasty, late 17th, early 18th century, introduced um, genuine, if you like, Chinese landscape imagery to Europe. Uh, as you can see in these uh, jars and vases at Knoll in Kent, uh, completely covered in Chinese landscapes. But at the same time, the set of vessels known as garnitures uh, were made specifically for the West for decorative use um, in European grand interiors. So again, a hybrid practice. And some of the Japanese lacquer that was being produced, like this cabinet at Petworth, with um, a, a Chinese-styled landscape, also seems to show some of the uh, European preference for symmetry because traditionally Japanese lacquer is extremely asymmetrical in its decoration, but here the landscape, to me at least, seems suspiciously symmetrical. So I think this is Japanese artists attuning their product to uh, the European market. But at the same time, Europeans becoming more and more aware of um, Japanese and Chinese aesthetics. And at the same time, somebody like Sir William Temple uh, a diplomat and intellectual was writing in the early 1690s in various essays he was writing uh, about his appreciation of this kind of naturalistic East Asian landscape style. So for instance, he wrote uh, in his uh, one of his essays, um, 
their greatest reach of imagination is employed in contriving figures where the beauty shall be great and strike the eye, but without any order or disposition of parts that shall be commonly or easily observed. And whoever observes the work upon the best India gowns or the painting upon their best screens or porcelains will find their beauty is all of this kind without order. So very interesting that Temple notes this kind of naturalistic asymmetrical style and appreciates it and contrasts it favorably with European symmetry and so on. In, in an essay in the same volume, he also refers to the sort of um, the intellectual associations and, and even ethical associations of East Asia, um, writing that honor and respect is nowhere paid to nobility and riches so much as it is here in, in China and Japan to virtue and learning. So he was again emphasizing the European idea that East Asia, China and Japan were countries that valued learning and um, and ethics and continuity in government and were sophisticated and, and wealthy nations. So you see this association between beautiful material objects like these and these ideas um, of China and Japan as sophisticated nations. This is a screen, a Chinese incised lacquer screen at Erdig in Wrexham. And you can see um, how the um, fascinating to see how it uses the so-called um, deep distance uh, perspective used in, in, in Chinese art, Shen Yuan, which is a kind of bird's eye view perspective that draws the viewer into the landscape. We're sort, of, we're sort of like a bird zooming down into these mountains where people are hunting. And at the same time, this screen embodies the principle of the yin shan or invisible visible, the use of uh, negative space and positive space, so the rocks and mountains, but with these voids in between where the hunting party is moving. So Europeans were being exposed to this in the late 17th, early 18th century. They wouldn't have completely understood it, but it was very much available. And these screens, like you've just seen, were taken apart, as Amalia von Solms did, uh, in the late 19th century and used as wall paneling, as you can see here in this scheme that's preserved in the Rex Museum in Amsterdam. So people were literally being surrounded by East Asian landscapes. And these landscapes were being copied in other media by European artisans, such as John van der Bank, who made these tapestries uh, for the English court and, and also this set at Belton House in Lincolnshire. And you can see that the composition of these tapestries is vaguely inspired by uh, Chinese incised lacquer. Originally, their backgrounds would have been darker, but also, again, translated. And you see this Orientalist process of adaptation and translation going on at the same time. Robert Robinson uh, a London scene painter, theatre painter, was also creating these painted panelling decorations for interiors in the 1690s in London. And you can see a pagoda there in the middle rising up, but also a lot of imagination and fantasy embellishing um, East Asian imagery. So again, a process, an, an Orientalist process uh, happening there. Wallpaper was starting to be produced in, in England, and this is uh, a wallpaper from Ord House in Northumberland, now in the V&A. And you can see how various different um, Asian elements are being combined. So lacquer in the black background, but also probably inspiration from Indian chintz. You can see a, a Chinese female figure in the top left hand corner there. It's a fascinating mixture. And here you can see some of those products that were available in the early 18th century. So on the right hand side, the Indian chintz, so the painted and printed cotton. Um, on the top left hand side, uh, English cruel wear, so a wool embroidered uh, linen, 
partly inspired by chintz, partly also inspiring chintz in, in a mutual way. And then bottom left, um, Chinese incised lacquer, but again, in the way of Amalia von Solms, taken apart and used to kind of veneer an English made chest. But again, the imagery, the bright colored burden flower imagery being available and part of the mixture in high-end interiors. Chinese embroidered silk was part of this as well. You can see the um, state bed at Cork Abbey on the left from the 1710s, two different types of embroidered silk, again with hunting scenes, but again enveloping the British um, consumer, the British um, elite, um, you know, inspiring their dreams perhaps. Um, and on the right, you can see the same kind of embroidered Chinese silk being used as a tablecloth in a Dutch uh, painting from the same period, 1710s. So this was everywhere. And then it it does actually start to appear, these motifs start to appear in gardens as well. This is the um, garden at Salzdalum in North Germany, where uh, Anton Ulrich of Braunschweig Wolfenbüttel um, uh, German aristocrat created this amazing Baroque monument you can see in the middle there. And it actually combines um, a Christian church steeple and a Chinese pagoda on the right. An extraordinary, again, you can see how Newhoff's image was, was being used. But this was inspired by a comment by the uh, philosopher Leibniz, who was saying that, you know, we, we need both Christian church and uh, the Chinese Confucianism, and we can learn from both. So here, that that idea of mutual inspiration was being expressed in a Baroque garden in North Germany. This was again um, in the uh, between 1706 and 9 that this was created. And at the same time, in southern Germany near Munich, Chinese hanging scroll paintings again of garden scenes, birds and flowers were being used as wall decoration uh, in the Pagodenberg, which is a garden pavilion in the Nymphenburg Palace near Munich. This is about 1720. And in England too, this kind of imagery was being copied by English wallpaper makers. This is an English wallpaper from the 1730s or 40s. And then we start to see Chinese style garden pavilions in England suddenly in the 1730s. And I don't quite know why it only started then. It may have something to do with this book that this image is from, mm -hmm. which is um, Jean-Baptiste Duhal's uh, book about China, Description de la Chine, which came out in 1736, was translated into English, which did contain some images of pavilions. But that may not be the sole reason. In any case, in the 1730s, for instance, you see um, at Grove House in Old Windsor, uh, the residence of Richard Bateman, created in about 1735, this very fanciful garden pavilion with vaguely um, Asian elements. He was um, uh, in the circle of Horace Walpole, uh, the sort of creative circle, people who were creating interiors and gardens uh, and inspiring each other. And at this time also, the term Sharawaji was being used to describe this kind of Orientalist taste. And it, this is a wonderfully Orientalist term in its own right, because it's, we don't even know where it really came from, this word Sharawaji. Various suggestions have been made that it was inspired by a number of different uh, Chinese phrases, or some Japanese phrases, various theories exist. Nobody knows exactly. The various words it might refer to all have something to do with irregularity um, and disordered uh, beauty. And this was the word being bandied about by people like Horace Walpole for the Chinese taste, the Asian style. Um, and it's it's very telling that it was a vague term. It was, its origin was not clear, but it was very suggestive. And that was part of the appeal of this style. William Kent may have designed these, uh, these garden pavilions on paper. They were never realized, but you can see how elements of Chinese architecture were being 
used um, sometimes with neo-Gothic elements as well, combined in a very free and creative way. And at Stowe in uh, Buckinghamshire, by 1738, um, this little garden pavilion was was erected in in a little pond um, possibly also made by William Kent who was active at Stowe at the time and then you see various other pavilions emerging a Chinese temple in the Drake Low Pond at Wuben Abbey by 1738 and this may be uh, the same pavilion or or its successor but it was on that island and there were various Chinese style buildings at Roxton Abbey in Oxfordshire. You can see a little box like pavilion here, very similar to the Stowe one around 1740. And here's another Roxton Abbey open pavilion, again, 1740. And in London too, um, the, um, at Montague House in Whitehall, uh, if you look just to the right of the building on the left of the painting, this Canaletto painting, you can see a little green structure there peeping out, which is actually still exists to this day. Uh, it's now at Boughton House in Northamptonshire, um, a canvas and wood uh, structure that was only put up in the summer, uh, created originally around 1745. And uh, at um, Studley Royal uh, in Yorkshire, uh, this picture, the top left hand side at the top of the hill there, you can see a tiny structure and a, a drawing on the right of what it looked like an open pavilion. Very fanciful, but the balustrade does correspond to a kind of leaning out balustrade you do see in certain types of Chinese architecture. So they must have had some kind of image of a Chinese building that they used for that, that seating and that balustrade. This was in 17, the mid 1740s. And at Shugborough in 1747, there were several Chinese style buildings erected, as you can see here. Again, very similar to the Roxton and the Stowe ones. So another Orientalist process that you get an English style of Chinese architecture, meant to be Chinese, but in a very recognizably related style that was developing in the 1730s, 40s. This is Shagbra slightly later because by 1752, there was also a pagoda erected there, as you can see on the right, together with all the other classical and Gothic structures, which also dotted the park. Um, at Virginia Water, the Duke of Cumberland had a so-called Mandarin junk, a Chinese style boat. But again, you can see the superstructure of the boat is very similar to the pavilions that have just been um, showing you, 1749. And at Starhead, interestingly, this single arch bridge, which was originally probably inspired by Palladio's Quattro Libri, where you have bridges like that, came to be called the Chinese Bridge because people associated single arch bridges with China. So again, interesting confusions and changing of names, changing of significance that a Palladian bridge can become a Chinese bridge. Starhead in the collection there, actually, there is this interesting Chinese mirror painting and the, the landscape depicted there with a big lake in the middle and a three arch bridge at the end does seem quite reminiscent of the, the Starhead landscape. So there may have been some inspiration um, some Chinese inspiration in the development of the, the English landscape garden as well, although it's very difficult to, to prove. And um, But there was debate about it at the time as well, whether certain elements of the English landscape garden were Chinese. And Horace Walpole was one of the people who refuted that argument very vehemently, but interesting. Um, at... Um, Croom, as you can see here, Croom Court in the late 1740s, um, a Chinese style bridge was built after a design by William Halfpenny, an English designer. Again, very much fantasy, but meant to look Chinese. And it's been recently reconstructed, as you can see here. And in, in a very, in a sort of um, 
uh, very much English landscape garden. And at Kew near London, uh, a so-called House of Confucius was constructed in, in 1749, which this is an image of, a two-story building, and apparently there were images of Confucius inside. So again, interesting combination of aesthetics and philosophy. And this is the Ranley Pleasure Garden in central London, where there was this rather charming uh, Chinese bridge, Chinese-style bridge built in uh, about... 1750. So it was obviously quite a popular style as well, not just for, for the elite and the connoisseurs. And that style of that bridge is actually echoed um, in the wonderful badminton bed from Badminton House, which is now in the V&A, which you can see on the right, which is in effect uh, a sort of miniature garden pavilion turned into a bed. Um, mm -hmm. And on the left, you can see a very similar, again, design for a garden pavilion at Wallington in Northumberland, also with some um, kind of Gothic elements thrown in as well. So it's amazing to see how styles were being mixed up, but also formats were being mixed up. You could have a bed that looked like a pavilion and vice versa, and it could all be <coughs> Chinese. Then in 1757, William Chambers um, published his book, Designs of Chinese Buildings, and he claimed to, uh, he had been in China himself, so he claimed authenticity. And this is an interesting moment when authenticity is used as an argument um, for the first time, almost. Um, and he produced designs like these in his book, which in retrospect are very much his uh, view of Chinese architecture, his very subjective view, but he um, projected it as being objective and accurate and authentic. And you can see buildings like this um, in his book and pavilions like these. And actually we can now see that these designs all look to be in quite a similar style, which was obviously Chambers projecting his version of Chinese architecture and things like this, um, but partly because it was so coherent as a, as a style, as a chamber's version of Chinese architecture, it proved to be very useful for uh, designers uh, of garden architecture and, and chinoiserie architecture. And here are some uh, images of furniture as well from the book. Chambers himself produced, made the, um, the pagoda at Q in 1761, which still exists, of course, interestingly combined with a Moorish Alhambra and a mosque uh, building, so a very eclectic um, cosmopolitan garden at this point. And he created, this was for the aviary, he created this Chinese style pavilion, and this design was to prove popular later as well. Here it is in one of his books. And these stylistic elements um, start returning in subsequent garden billion buildings. At the same time, people were also um, importing plants from East Asia. In 1739, apparently the first Chinese camellia flowered in England, uh, was, was made to flower uh, at Thorndon Hall in, in Essex. And George Edwards, in his book, A Natural History of Uncommon Birds, represented this, what he thought was that camellia, together with a peacock pheasant. But it's interesting that the image is actually a very Orientalist image in the sense that it echoes birds and flowers seen in Chinese wallpapers, for instance, with the picturesque rock, which is a typical um, design element in a Chinese garden seen in Chinese wallpapers. So Edwards was claiming to be scientific and authentic, but he was clearly being influenced by Chinese decorative art as well. And it echoed in British decorative art, for instance, in this um, Chelsea plate from 1765. Here you can see Chambers designs um, influencing uh, British uh, garden architecture. 
Uh, this is at Rest Park in 1761. This building was erected. This is a recent recreation of it. And this is at Amesbury Abbey, uh, where this pavilion was built on a bridge over a stream, probably in the 1770s, possibly by John Smeaton, but in Chambers's style. As you can see here, it combines various elements from Chambers' book, for instance, the pavilion on the bridge, the, the pillared roof, the two-story structure, and the circular windows seem to be clearly Chambers elements used there. Initially, Chambers' book was more popular in France. A lot of French garden buildings uh, were influenced by Chambers, as you can see here in this pavilion at um, Bonnel um, from the 1770s, and the Désert de Retz, also from the late 1770s very much in the Chambers style. 1789, um, uh, uh, the Chinese dairy at Wuben Abbey was created. And, and so here we see Chambers being used in, in England again. Um, and on the interior as well, various motifs of the painted decoration are from Chambers, the furniture, is inspired by Chambers as well. And the even the painted glass windows have some of the figures copied from Chambers's book, as you can see in the figure on the left there. And when uh, Humphrey Repton was asked to create an additional Chinese style garden at Wuben uh, in the early 19th century, he again um, referred back to Chambers for his pavilions. Prince of Wales, George IV, is of course known as a lover of chinoiserie, Chinese style. Uh, Royal Pavilion at Brighton is, is a famous building in that regard. Initially, he had plans to do the exterior in Chinese style as well. He had designs by William Porden uh, drawn up. Eventually, he decided for an Indian, pseudo-Indian style for the exterior, but the interior was completely done in Chinese style, a very fanciful, very personal, subjective uh, Chinese style. But for instance, this room, the, um, the saloon, is almost a kind of interior garden with the Chinese wallpaper um, <coughs> acting as garden scenery and sort of trellis-like decoration around the frieze. He also created actual Chinese style buildings, George, George IV at Virginia Water, this fishing pavilion, which was created in the late 1820s, again, in an extremely fanciful, extremely subjective Chinese style. And here the Chinese style almost becomes kind of nostalgic and uh, symbolic of George IV's withdrawal from society and his immersion in his own fantasy world. So even as the British are learning more about China. In some respects, they want to distance China um, and turn it into a fantasy image, which is another fascinating Orientalist mechanism. The Chinese house at Stowe that we've already seen before uh, was moved to a nearby country house, Wooten uh, House, in, uh, and by the 1820s, this painted decoration was added uh, and it is actually inspired largely by Chambers's book, again, showing his influence. <laughs> Chambers becomes the standard. So it's sometimes said that after George IV, Shinmazri kind of disappeared, but in the early 19th century, it was still everywhere. Uh, this is an early design for Clifton Suspension Bridge in near um, Bristol. <laughs> And in, in this 1829 design by the father of um, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, Sir Mark Brunel, he actually proposed a pagoda as the central pier of the bridge, showing how prevalent and popular that kind of uh, vocabulary still was in the 1820s. And this is at Alton Towers, um, not the present day um, amusement park, but the the country garden where this pagoda fountain was created in 1832, made in Colebrookdale by the uh, iron foundry and actually a, a jet of water coming out from, from the top. So again, 
the language of the pagoda is continuing, uh, of course now being combined with East Asian plants around it. Wuben Abbey got its own, uh, got another chamber style pagoda in the maze, again in the uh, in 19, 1831 this was, and also on the more popular, um, in, in the more popular uh, world, this was Cremorne Gardens, uh, a Victorian pleasure ground um, in London, where a pagoda bandstand was created in the 1840s and 50s. So the style was, was still popular in the Victorian period. And Biddulph Grange is a garden in Staffordshire, where in at the same time in the late 1850s, a Chinese style garden was being created um, with authentic East Asian plants, but completely fantastical architecture, inspired actually by the willow pattern, which was a, an English um, manufactured late 18th, early 19th century style of glazed earthenware, um, inspired by Japan, Chinese blue and white porcelain, but actually very much a British product and this British Orientalist product was now inspiring this Chinese style garden. So it's a fascinating kind of loop. Uh, mid, 18th, mid 19th century, of course, Japanese products become very much more available as Japan was forced to open to the rest of the world. Um, so Japanese garden imagery becomes more available and fashionable. Um, as in the case of this lacquered picnic set, which is at Snows Hill Manor. Um, things like um, carved stone Japanese lanterns originally made for temples were now being imported and used in British gardens like here at Nyman's where Ludwig Messel was creating various um, gardens in the 1890s and early 1900s including a heath garden and a rock garden. So Japanese lanterns were being used, again, as kind of symbolic emblems of Japan. Uh, and the Japanese were part of this. They were producing these originally Buddhist lanterns specifically for the European and American markets at this point. The Japanese influence come along later after the Chinese influence, or were they? It became very strong in the late 19th century because then Japan was forced to open up to international trade. And one of the ways they responded to that was by producing a lot of, exporting a lot of decorative art, which was very popular. So it created a kind of renewal of interest in Japan. Here too at Clifton in Buckinghamshire, the garden is in a kind of vaguely Japanese style. But the pavilion is is a fascinating um, uh, object because it's actually a pavilion that was um, made for a French, one of the great exhibitions in France, the Exposition Universelle of 1867, uh, where the Marquis of Hartford purchased it after that exhibition closed and it eventually ended up in Buckinghamshire. But the pavilion is actually inspired by an 18th century French pavilion created for the Chateau de Romainville in about 1780, um, and which was then documented in a, in a book about French gardens, Les Jardins Anglo-Chinois by Le Rouge. Uh, but originally that pavilion at Romainville was inspired by chambers. So we have chambers going to France, the French, that French pavilion then being recreated in the 19th century and then being brought to Buckinghamshire. So a wonder, again, a wonderful uh, Orientalist loop. But as I said, authenticity was very much more of a concept in the late 19th century, early 20th century. So the idea to have an authentic or relatively authentic Japanese garden became very fashionable. This is Tatton Park, a uh, garden created for the third Baron and Baroness Edgerton in the early 1910s, inspired again by a great exhibition, the Japan-British Exhibition of 1910, and possibly also with 
the help of Japanese designers and uh, gardeners who had worked at the Japan British Exhibition. So an interesting example also of self-orientalism, if you like, the Japanese recreating their gardens for a British audience. It shows the influence of these great exhibitions, and it shows that at least the semblance of authenticity was, was very important by this time. Kingston Lacey, uh, another Japanese garden created in about 1910 for Henrietta Banks. And then we see that filtering through in other styles of English gardens, such as this one at Sizer Castle, a rock garden, but very much using rocks in an Asian-inspired way and with lots of aces. So you see how the Japanese style is being domesticated into these, um, these British gardens in the early 20th century. And then finally, um, I just wanted to show this example of a, uh, a painted screen painted by a British artist, Peter Thompson, for a modern house looked after by the National Trust, the Homewood um, in Surrey, created in about 1960. Peter Thompson had trained in uh, Chinese uh, ink painting techniques. So here we see an example of a British art artist actually going through the looking glass and, and becoming part of the Asian tradition and making something again for a British interior. So this is where we end up in the 20th century. But